Hello and welcome back to the Press Conference Podcast. Today I've got Cara Head on to speak about her role in managing the social media for the, I'd probably say, renowned English Twitter account of Bayer Leverkusen. We discuss building communities on social, the importance of foreign clubs interacting in the English market, the benefits of working remotely and how learning a second language can open doors. It's a real eye-opener and personally I've implemented a lot of the stuff she said already, so make sure to stay tuned for this one. So Cara, just firstly, my first question is, just describe what essentially is your job for the club, you know, managing a, a German club's English account. Yeah, um, my main responsibilities are just um, related to the English Twitter account. Uh, I manage that every day and uh, create content um, for it. And I've been doing that for about, um, I guess I just finished my fifth Bundesliga season. So mm-hmm. almost five years. Um five years in the fall and yeah a lot of it is just growing that international fan base and bringing Bundesliga to an English-speaking audience. Mm. I'm I'm guessing it's just not sort of translating tweets from the German account then do you sort of have the freedom to post like whatever you want in terms of the English account? They do give me a lot of creative freedom yeah Um, I mean some stuff is just translated when it comes to like interviews and player statements and stuff obviously that's just a direct um, German to English translation, but it's kind of uh, the personalities of fans on both sides are quite different, mm. and the needs of fit the international fan base is quite different. So um, obviously the strategy is like a bit altered to that perspective. Yeah, and you know it must be quite hard to actually you know for a, a German club like Bayer Leverkusen to get into the English market because you know I see so much right now with so many. English sort of speaking accounts, you know, whether it be like Real Madrid, Barcelona, um, Bayern Munich, you know, is the aim to try and convert people into fans abroad and, you know, to compete with these teams? Yeah, I don't see it as much of a competition with other teams as I do just building like the brand itself. I think we've created like a really unique voice um, in the English speaking Mm -hmm. audience. So I don't see it as like a big competition. I see it more as like just finding where we fit in and if people enjoy it great if not (laughs) then it's also fun but I think we had a really good shoe in when we first started with Chicharito in the U.S. market because he was already really big and a lot of people knew him Mm -hmm. and that's when the um, international accounts were first launched but obviously it's evolved into other things now where he wasn't like the he's not the center of attention or anything like that but yeah it's just kind of being our own thing and then focusing on that and not really so much on what others are doing yeah of course and you know I've, i actually spoke to the um the media manager at hall city and obviously you had that um really viral connect four game with them is engagements like that really kind of good for you guys because it sort of gets your name in there with you know the english market and people who potentially would support by leverkusen as a second team yeah that specific situation was wild it was like the weekend that everything got cancelled I think and so so many eyes were on it because so many people were desperate to have some sort of sporting event to follow um so yeah stuff like that's good because it gets uh people looking at your account who aren't normally there and are kind of like oh I kind of like this um maybe I'll follow and see what else they do in the future um so that's kind of cool yeah it it definitely helps to interact with international clubs that people are maybe more familiar with that definitely brings us into conversations that we maybe wouldn't normally be in. Yeah, and something like that, is that, you know, I'm guessing it was sort of off the cuff, you know, was it planned at all between you or, you know, it was such a random encounter, I'm sort of trying to figure out a bit of the background to this. No, you know, we had asked, um, I think I wrote a tweet that said something like, uh, what should we do, like asking for suggestions from fans, what they wanted to see. And one fan drew up a Connect Four board <laughs> and was like let's play connect four and then i i responded like yeah that's kind of funny let's do it and then they just disappeared and then the whole city uh admin came in and was like well we'll play um so it was very like spur of the moment which usually the best performing things on twitter specifically are i think it's a very like reactionary app and so yeah it was all very like organic and not planned at all yeah it was very sort of weird from my perspective because obviously Hull City is actually a local club to me so I was thinking you know, <laughs> w- you know what's happening here um, but in terms of creating content for social media and stuff you know as a as a foreign account you know even as a just as a social media manager 
you don't always have to stick to football, do you? You can go on to different mediums and, you know, just connect with people on a basis, can't you? Yeah, you can do... Um, you, I think you should always focus more on your community than your content. Anyway, I mean, content is very important, but it's only going to perform well if you have already built a strong community and know what they want to see. And so everything that we kind of create is basically rooted in what the community wants and what we think they would respond to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, spending a lot of time interacting with them and understanding what they like and what they want to see and what they expect from you. Because you can, I see a lot of sports teams will spend a lot of time creating this really great eye-catching content. But if it's not something that the audience is even interested in, then it's just maybe going to be a little bit of a waste of time. <laughs> Um, yeah, for sure. To do that. Yeah, mo all of, almost all of the content is really just rooted in catering it to what the community actually wants to see. Yeah, and you speak about like community and stuff, and you know, you yourself ba based in the US, um, you know, do you get to do much sort of fan engagement stuff in your city, or is it purely just on social media, this community? We haven't done a lot of local stuff. I think back in February, we did like an esports tournament. Mm -hmm. for the Dortmund game here which was really fun because um, yeah. we had like the watch party and then I think players could it was like a 2v2 tournament and the winners got like a nice prize package and I think we had planned to do more of that this year but it's kind of obviously yeah. been put on the back burner <laughs> for the foreseeable future. You know things like these is there a sort of community you can see in the US like actual physical community of, of Bayer Leverkusen fans? I think we definitely could. It's just having the, I don't want to say resources, but having more, like doing more like on the ground here. We just haven't reached that point yet. And I think when you look at things like what NBC does with their like Premier League morning activations across the US, like that stuff's really, really cool. Hmm. Um, and I think there's so many casual fans of the sport here that don't necessarily identify with uh, one club. Yeah, that I think there's sure. a lot of potential. But um, a lot of that just comes down to being there on the ground and doing that and meeting these people. But that's not something that we've really reached yet. Yeah. So do you guys, uh, you know, as a, you know, your place of work in the U.S., do you guys work from like an office together or, you know, do you work from home managing this social media? I usually will. I used to work from cafes, but now I'm stuck at home. Uh, in New York, it's only me. So there's no need for an office really. There are other people in different parts of the U.S. that work in different areas like PR and um, like business development, but we aren't like physically close to each other. So there's no need to have an office to go to. That must be quite great then to, you know, sort of think of my own situation. I'm, you know, nine to five going to the office and stuff. It must be really great to, you know, have that freedom to, you know, sort of work as, you know, yeah. use, use the word digital nomad sort of thing. Yeah, I do think it's something that you have to get used to because you have to be really responsible with your time. But I do really enjoy the kind of setup where you can like build your life around your work or no, build your work around your life and not mm. the other way around. Because in a nine to five, I think the way that you set up your life is really structured yeah. <laughs> and maybe limited to what, how you use your time and when you can do certain things. But yeah, the way that I have things set up is really nice I kind of have a lot of flexibility in how I can schedule and plan each day for sure and how do you sort of manage stuff remotely then um from the U.S. is you know is the time difference a hindrance at all you know do you have much contact with the people in Germany I think the time difference the only thing that is a big downside is just like the early morning games <laughs> I'm not a morning person <laughs> so those can be difficult for me and then if you have something that comes up later in the day, it can be difficult to get an answer because maybe they're already sleeping or something mm. um, in Germany. But for the most part, it's not difficult to communicate with them because we have like group chat and then we have like our individual chats and uh, we text every single day. I think there's almost not any day that I don't speak to someone <laughs> from the club. So that communication's never been a big issue. Um, I think we live in a world where we're all so connected that um, it's kind of impossible to have um, big communication problems. Hmm. I'm, I'm sort of interested to know, obviously, the, I'm, I'm guessing all the players, sort of the main language around the club, is, I'm guessing is German. Do you do sort of any interviews or um, with the players? Do you have much access to them? And do you, um, if you don't, do you have to sort of translate their words as such? 
Yeah, I only go over there like two or three times a season, I think, in a normal season. So I am only seeing them a couple times a year. So I'm not necessarily Mm -hmm. conducting a lot of interviews. Uh, If I do ask players questions, it's in English, of course. But most of the time, the interviews are being done in German because even though they all speak such good English, I think they prefer to speak in German because that's their native language. And so usually I'm just translating those. And um, of course, if there's Spanish or Portuguese or something, then I'll be given the translation because I don't speak those languages. But there is a ton of translation work (laughs) involved in all of it. Yeah, so do you speak to the um, like the staff in, in Germany as well? Do you speak to them in German or do you speak in English? Oh, we speak in English, I think, because when we started, like, there were so many languages involved on our weekly calls that our, like, communication just kind of defaulted to English and then it's always just stayed like that, hmm. which is fine for me, <laughs> of yeah. course. Uh, it's much easier to speak English. So, yeah, there's not so much speaking that has to go on from my side. I've sort of looked into your LinkedIn and stuff, and, you know, if, if my research is right, you actually studied German at, at university. You know, just, just tell us a bit about that and why you chose to study that. Well, I actually, it was a very, like, delayed um, choice. I was studying, like, media production. Like, I always wanted to go into film making and writing, and that was my original plan. And then when I was coming to the end of my degree, my advisor said that I needed to take like two semesters of a language to be able to graduate. Mm. And I'd signed up for, I think it was Hebrew or something. I signed up for a really random language and the course got canceled um, because like no one signed up for it. And so then I ended up having to take German because it was at the same time. So it wasn't even really something that I chose of my own. It just was something that kind of happened. But then I ended up really enjoying the classes and I thought learning a language is super fun. And um, I really enjoyed the department. They were the best like professors that I've had my entire time uh, at university. And so I got an opportunity to go abroad for like a year to, I just extended my degree to add a second major um, in German. Mm. And that's how that became part of my degree. So studying like abroad for a year to finish up that as a second major. So it wasn't something that I had originally planned. Do you think it, you sort of need some sort of passion for maybe the country or the culture of the language you're trying to learn? Because, you know, for me, at, at our school, um, we had French and, and German, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still rubbish at German. I only know a few select words and such. I think it's because I wasn't very interested in, you know, the culture and stuff like that, personally. Do you think it's easier if, you, if you're really into that sort of thing? I don't know. I think it would help if you really are excited to like move somewhere or work somewhere. But for me, I think the thing that made the biggest difference was just the, t- the way it was being taught and um, the environment I was learning in um, at my university. It was just a really positive experience. And I think a lot of times we associate like language learning with like experiences in school that are not so positive or not so fun. It's just kind of like mm. something that you have to do. And I think what makes a difference with any language probably is going to be the way in which you're learning it and making sure it's like an enjoyable experience and not something that feels tedious and difficult. When you took on German as, you know, that second major, as you said, was it always sort of in your head that you wanted to maybe move abroad to work in a, in a you know, a German job, or maybe a translator job? I wasn't really interested in translation. I did, once I was living there as a student, I was like, wow, I I really like it here. I could imagine a life here. Mm -hmm. Um, But when I had first decided to go over, I think I had no idea really what I wanted to do. I just knew that I I really enjoyed making things. And as I said, I was interested in filmmaking. And some of my initial thoughts were just kind of like, okay, this is something I'll do. I'll finish the major and see what happens. And then I just really enjoyed being over there. So I ended up staying an extra year not to study but I got a job in Berlin for a year as like a video journalist and then I came back after that but I think starting to learn the language definitely changed my opinions on like if I would live abroad or what I would like to do with my life. Yeah and did you always you know after you graduated and stuff did you always think about getting into social media or did that come later? That actually came later um I had done some internships in college where I did a little bit of social media work But that really came about after the video journalism role when I was moving back to the U.S. Um, I was just kind of looking for a job that still was related to German a bit. And I ended up finding a posting for the job that I have now. 
And so it just kind of happened very randomly, but I'm really thankful for it because it's been such a good experience. Yeah, and is social media something you've sort of learned along the way, or do you think you've sort of been on the, you know, the platform Twitter and Facebook and stuff so long that you already knew how to actually difficult. effectively get people to engage? It's difficult to say because I think our generations have spent so much time mm. just growing up with these apps. I think I was in high school when Facebook first came out, but even before that, we were using things like MySpace. And I think we're just so used to social media that it's not the most difficult adjustment, I think. What is difficult is like figuring out how to build a community and how to cater what you already know about social media to a brand. That's the challenging part. But I think just like the inner workings of social media, that's almost something that's like native to us at this point. Yeah. So how come you never uh, went into, you know, after graduating into the sort of film side of things? Was it just the case social media, you know, you, you like that more? I mean, I did. I did really enjoy what I was doing with social media. I did some production work. On, on the side too and um, like working as a production assistant and things like that and I thought that was okay <laughs> I, I learned a lot about working on set and stuff but that path wasn't necessarily for me I think I'm learning more now about storytelling and um, content creation than I would be if I was kind of working my way up a film set so that's kind of why I focus more on social media for now because I think I'm everything I'm learning now is more useful than what I was learning as like a production assistant. But I guess that production assistant experience probably gave you a really good ground on how to actually create content for social media, didn't it? It's actually quite different. I think a lot of the production assistant stuff is like very, um, like making sure sets are closed. You're not really doing a lot. You're just kind of assisting. So you don't really get a ton of hands-on work, I think. Okay. What's helped me most with, like social media stuff is like my passion for like storytelling and just being creative. And yeah, I think that's just what helps me the most in social media is like caring more about storytelling. <laughs> yeah, say. for sure. So in terms of it, looked at, obviously looked at your career history along the, along the way. And, you know, was it a job you got with the, it was it the Bundesliga you got it with the English accounts? Sort of how did that come about? Um, The Bundesliga role that came about, I guess maybe a year or two after I was doing a Leverkusen account, I was approached by someone with the Bundesliga who um, asked if I would want to do some stuff for them as well. And so I said yes, I thought that would be fun. Mm. And I did that for a couple of years, but I stopped a little while ago because I just wanted like more weekend time to myself. Because yeah. um, it's hard to work every day of the weekend because I was like never seeing friends and stuff. Yeah, I think that's the but big that's, thing with, with football yeah. as well, isn't it? You know, it's weekend games and stuff. And was that essentially like two full-time jobs then? No, because my work with Leverkusen is only part-time and it always has been. So I've always kind of balanced it with other stuff, like the production assistant thing or when I was working at the Bundesliga. So it's always just been like uh, freelance. And did when you got the job at Leverkusen, did you approach them and apply or did they sort of find you? Uh, it was a job posting. I think it was on Indeed. And so I applied there and just did like a normal like interview, like with any other job. I think there's a lot of luck involved, just like the right place at the right time and having like some like the skills and things that fit with the role. Being at a football club and that, I guess you had a, uh, you know, an interest in, in football as well. Yeah, definitely. I started playing football when I was like three or four, I think. And I played all the way through my like teenage years. Um, I was like on a travel team. It was like I was super obsessed as a kid. I didn't imagine working in it as an adult, if I'm honest, but I mean, I'm happy to be. <laughs> yeah. It's a good time. Um, it's a lot of fun. I guess as growing up, I never imagined like what a career in football would look like if you weren't a footballer. Yeah. Um, and I think that's why maybe I didn't pursue anything. But yeah, it's just kind of a really weird combination of all these different things that I'm interested in. <laughs> I don't know how it happened, to be honest, but just to have something where it's like the language that you learned, the sport that you liked, and um, and like the storytelling, social media aspect of it, it's a little bit crazy. Yeah, it sounds, um, well, it sounds like you've got the perfect job for you, really. I think football media as a whole is so hard to get into, you know. I did three years of, you know, just free work just to get my foot in the door. And for yourself, do you think that second language opened the doors and, you know, got your foot in the door essentially i would definitely say that i think it's so rare especially we're so lazy as native english speakers when it comes to learning languages mm -hmm. um 
but I think it definitely opens the door, especially if you want to work in like international football, because there's not so much, there's far less competition um, when you're a native English speaker who has additional language skills, because you're just going to be so far ahead of so many other native English speakers who want the same job. I think if you're looking at like Premier League stuff, it might be different because I don't know how high the needs are for additional languages there. Um, but working in other leagues for sure, I think learning a second language is, would be really important. Yeah, I think a lot of, you know, just from what I've seen from some Premier League teams like Manchester United and stuff, they're going on to sort of Spanish, Arabic accounts and such. For you, what do you think is the best language to learn? Obviously, I know you, you do German, but in terms of a football sense, you know, is German the, the one which people are looking out for at the moment? I think it depends on which league you would be interested in working in, because I think all of them are looking to grow in the uh, international markets, um, especially the English speaking <clears throat> markets so I don't think you can go wrong obviously if you think about the top five leagues you have like German French Spanish Italian mm. I think those would be like your safest bets but I think I don't think there's one that is better than the other in terms of those in terms of the U.S. as well obviously you said you grew up playing football you know, soccer as it is over there and how much um, has that helped the opportunities in terms of you know the jobs we do in social media and media? Because you know MLS is a lot bigger than it was you know five ten years ago. Yeah, I think it's really important because it helps. I don't know. I think it's if you're coming just now into the soccer market, a football market in the US, there's just so much that you're not going to understand. I think about what the market actually was like maybe like ten twenty years ago. Mm. Because when I was growing up as a kid, like, I would never, ever, ever imagine that so many teams from Europe would be interested in what's going on here. Yeah. Um, it just seemed like we were, like, such a small community of people that were interested in a sport. It was always just, like, uh, an afterthought in the sports world in the U.S. And so to see it explode like it is now is really exciting. But I think it's nice to have that. I don't know, just to have grown up with that and to know that community so well, to know what the youth soccer community is like here. I think there's just so much insight that I got from being part of it that's helped me a lot in growing a brand within that world. Mm, and growth of the MLS and stuff, you've seen it from, as you said, 10, 20 years ago, what, what it were like and, and stuff. Do you think it's helped the, the fact that, um, you know, you've got players like David Beckham, Frank Lampard, Steven Gerrard all go into the MLS um, in recent years and really putting a spotlight on it for you know the people of the UK essentially. Yeah I definitely think that helps I think um, at least for me I don't I can't speak for everyone but growing up it was really hard to find matches to watch especially before like YouTube and stuff there wasn't like wide broadcasting of international leagues and stuff so a lot of times we would just be identifying with these big names where you could find like highlight videos or um, things that you could buy in a shop and so to see those big names eventually come over and play, it gives your league more credibility, I think. And it's nice to see them, like, care to grow the sport here because I think there's a lot of potential. And yeah, I think it's definitely helped a lot. Do you support an MLS team, then? Uh, I do not. I am more of, like, a just enjoy the sport itself. <laughs> I think there are two teams here in New York, and I've only gone once. I went to a derby match, but it actually was really bad. I think the I think NYCFC lost, like, Okay. seven to one it was a really it was sad to see like Pirlo take such a beating yeah of course I think the thing I've seen obviously I've never been to an MLS game in my life um, I've seen it on TV and such the thing I, I see about the MLS is it's so commercialized I think and you know just you know it's obviously got that American feel you know do you think that's a real sort of factor in you know jobs and stuff coming up there and they put you know a, people in America put the emphasis on, you know, marketing and social media and build up yeah. this big brand. Yeah, I think there's definitely a lot to do there. Um, I think I think their specific situation is challenging because all of the MLS is, con all of MLS stuff is controlled by like MLS, like every individual team. Hmm. Um, and all of the applications go through like one source, which is like teamwork online. So I find it really difficult for people to get their, to get their like, stuff out there because there's only really one channel unless you know someone so I hope that they'll open up the way that they do hire talent at some point 
because I do think there are a lot of jobs there and there are a lot of talented people that could take those jobs. But I think the application process for MLS teams is really odd at the moment. Do you see yourself ever working in the MLS? Or, you know, as you said before, you were interested in the the German side of things. Do you ever see yourself moving back to Germany for a bit again? I don't know. I would be more excited to move back to Europe, even if it's not Germany, um, than I would be to work for an MLS team. I really like working in international football. I think the audience right now is really big, uh, much bigger than the MLS. And I like the pace of it. Um, Yeah, I just have a lot more fun working in the kind of thing I'm doing now. So I don't have any MLS ambitions at the moment. Maybe that will change at some point. I don't know. For now, I think I would be more likely to go back to Europe than target an MLS team. Obviously, there's a lot of you know students listening to this podcast. From your perspective, of people who want to get to where you are at the moment, what steps do they need to take? You know, if they're just a student at the moment, maybe graduating soon. Yeah, I would say definitely learn a language. I think that is the most important thing, um, especially to work in international sports. Um, and I would just develop as many skills as possible if you're wanting to work in social because I think the list gets longer and longer and in terms of like what's expected of you in terms of like video editing shooting video photos um like graphic design work there's I think there's just an endless list of things that you can learn that can set you apart from other people and just accumulating as many of those skills as you can um while you have the resources to do so I think when you're studying at a university, you have a lot of tools that you maybe take for granted while you're there and don't always make use of them. (laughs) So yeah, just using your time and what you have available to you to learn as many things as possible that you would use in a social or content creation setting. Now, there's always a, the last question I ask everyone um, who comes on this show and you know, that's essentially what is your dream job? Dream job. Oh, I don't know. I like to do so many different things. As I said, I, I really like storytelling and I would love to make films at some point. But I also realize that that's not the only thing that I want to do. I think when you are making films, you're doing it like once a year or something. I really enjoy having my hands on a lot of different things. So I don't know if there's one specific thing that I want to do. But as long as I'm able to continue creating stuff and making stuff and uh, storytelling, and interacting with people on like a daily basis around the world, I think I'll be happy. (laughs) I really like what I'm doing now. And so if I can do what I'm doing, maybe on a bigger scale eventually, then yeah, that would be the dream, I guess. And that marks the end of another interesting chat, this time with Kara, who, after speaking, has got me really interested in the second language thing, to be honest. And it's something I've been looking into for quite a while now, an actual physical course where I can get a qualification. So if anyone has any recommendations on that, please do get in touch with me. The chat also opened my eyes pretty much to the remote work arrangement. Some of us, myself included, are still working from home because of the COVID situation and I'm actually finding it a lot more productive and I think it's because I can be more flexible and to be honest I manage my time a lot better as well. As always please do join the discussion on Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram. There's also a Facebook group which now has around 2,100 members. If you want to join that just search The Press Conference on Facebook and you can request to join. There's also a lot of regular listeners to this podcast, which is absolutely fantastic. But to help me reach more people, and if you do enjoy these episodes, please give it a good review on Apple Podcasts, or even just a Twitter post or word of mouth recommendation to your course mate, your friend. It goes a long way and will really help me grow this community we have. But again, thanks for listening, and I'm hoping to get more consistent with the uploading of these new episodes. So it'd be great if you could subscribe and look out for new releases very soon. Thank you.